Could you tell the story of revolutionary France without mentioning Napoleon? That may appear to be a question with an obvious answer, but what if I told you there is a way? Before we get there, let's consider how certain lenses of history overemphasize the impact of an individual and thus obscure the impact of the masses, and then look at a remedy to that issue. Social history is the lens of understanding history that focuses on the experiences and conditions of average people as the motivators of historical momentum, reactions to government action, popular revolt, protest and pressure, all the way down to simple realities of lived experiences. Social history is focused on people, the people. It very broadly makes the argument that historical currents shift and flow with the needs and behaviors of the many, and that in focusing on the few, we lose sight of a lot of things. The core of history is thus driven by structural forces, governments, classes, etc., more so than individuals. In a fairly unique turn for the historical strategy genre, Humankind, a game by Amplitude Studios, is focused on a people and culture as it moves through time. This, and other elements of the game, are going to serve as a guide through the concept of social history. If you want to look at how this game differs from, say, civilization, I have an entire video on that. In Humankind, culture shifts and evolves dynamically, with choices made by the player, often informed by surrounding events in the game. The game focuses not on narrow details like individual leaders, nor on such large abstractions like that one's culture remains statically Greek forever. In the end, of course, the game still needs abstractions, and they look similar to something like Civ. Population is just a number, and resource allocation is hardly micromanaged. And yet, it has some aesthetic and technical distinctions that lean toward social history. Humankind's most forward expression of a social history lens is aesthetic, and we'll get to why that's the case, but for now, let's explore how the game presents itself as social history. However, there will be an imperfect comparison, and there's a reason for that. Humankind is the story of people rather than states, not as individuals, but as a collective entity that changes through time. The culture your people develop is in some ways reactive to events. The way your people respond to crisis shapes their identity moving forward, as seen in the ideology axes. There aren't really great people. Individuals only come up in the game in so much as they cause events and are reacted to. In some ways, the fluidity of culture and the slide from one to the next embodies an element of social history, the primacy of the people over powers, government structures, and individuals like leaders, lords, and oligarchs. If we spoke about cultures as unchanging entities that have always existed, we'd have to account for people just vanishing into thin air, like literal people. At some point, Romans stopped being Roman. There's a complicated history to that, but the lived experience of it wasn't like suddenly people vanished or were wholesale replaced. And while humankind might be simple in how things change between eras, it emphasizes continuity, that people are still there. The game like EU4 has events, and they tend to be focused on societal trends and crises. As far as Civ goes, events were unique to Civ4 as a game mechanic, unless we speak to the Civ6 inclusion of natural disasters. EU4 has events, as I said, but more of them tend to focus on individuals and historical events. The ethos of our people in-game develops in reaction to events in the world and choices that we, unseen governors, make. Social history in the real world is often the study of just such a thing, how people at large responded to an event, policy, regime change, how it affected not only material lives, but what reaction it provoked in people. In a game like Europa, or especially in Civ, leaders are given traits and personalities. The Emphasis on leaders does not exist in humankind. And this isn't just a stylistic choice on behalf of the studio. Some of their other games have leaders with very large and robust personalities. 
But humankind lacks ageless beings like great generals and civ leaders. At most, they slapped a character model onto an AI diplomacy window just to humanize the opponent, so you're not just fighting a menu. AIs do have personalities assigned, they're just a lot less emphatic than Civ. More products of seeking variety than any kind of narrative. Taken as a whole, individuals are not a big deal as far as the game is concerned. One of the strongest elements of humankind's social history arsenal is making soldiers require population. Other games in the genre have their soldiers appear from thin air, instant soldier, just add gun, or they have their own manpower pool. Units being tied to population does a bit to lift them up from being some degree of expendable, rather than a waste of production when they die. You lose something greater than a turn of city focus. They may not have been your favorite special unit guy, but it sucks to lose people. Following that, when you're in the Neolithic era, you don't have some alpha unit leader king guy who does more damage and is the only one who can settle an outpost. There's no mythical hero leader of your ancient people as far as the game is concerned. Any part of your broader collective society, any member, any unit, is able to do the same thing as any other of its same means. Humankind is not without mm, complications in depicting social history, but that's why I'm also going to put out a bonus episode on why social history is inherently hard to map onto games like this, precisely because of how games in the genre are designed. A very short example would be how revolutions don't matter the way they should, and as such, an expression of the will of the people is reduced to, like, a temporary malice or a change in your government rather than your role in it. They're not a game over. Social history is about looking at people who are away from the locus of power, to try and understand how social currents and societal crises impact things, and as such, does not really have the space for individual heroes or top-down authority. That's what I meant before when I said the comparison was imperfect. It can't help but be, thanks to the medium that is top-down gameplay. In the last video, I posited that Great Man Theory begs the question implicitly of how many ordinary soldiers equate to one Napoleon. Humankind doesn't have a framework that even comes close to asking that question. There are no super units. There is no Napoleon. A social history framework understands that the question of an individual's comparative value is unanswerable, and also moot. In real life, that kind of question culminates in crediting Napoleon with the entire French Revolution, that somehow before he even had power, he was building to his destiny, even if we know he was not the only one there. Leaving behind that framework might even be a radical approach for some people seeing history without this particular narrative bias. So how does this compare to other games? Are we Napoleon in Civ? Are we Napoleon in EU4? Kind of. We're at least attached to an individual in a way we can imagine. We may be able to make a custom avatar in humankind, but in one sense they're superfluous, and in another the customization just removes further grounding. And this points out a weakness in the game, as well as within social history. It's harder to attach oneself to a narrative in this framework. The lack of individuals to tie ourselves to, to mark the passage of time with, to be embodied through, as in Europa and Civ, is fairly apparent. Now, I don't think this is an outright flaw with the game, mind you, nor with social history, so much as an admission that the appeal has to come from somewhere else. Of course, the biggest weakness with social history is that it, quite simply, cannot be comprehensive, be it broadly from lack of surviving sources — people didn't often seek to chronicle peasant life compared to court and kings — or narrowly from not enough corroboration, there are gaps within a social history education. In some places, no record exists and no archaeology can help. All that's left to us is to take a more traditional approach. Of course, games don't have that issue because they form a more or less perfect telling of history. The logs don't lie, and we kind of write the story anyway. Sometimes the details of social history can feel mundane, or too small to paint a scene on their own. But we're reaching toward an upside. What we often do in social history is just read some man's journal, and we learn he had tea for breakfast and what his job was. And that's not a lot on its own. Maybe it doesn't feel like it answers the biggest questions in history, but that's the magic. We take the pieces and make a mosaic of history. 
from such a journal, we would learn that tea was even available in that time and place, and to common people, or people of certain means, that a potter could afford it. Focusing on great men can give us just as mundane information, but doesn't tend to extrapolate into anything. What does knowing how many peacocks King Louis could afford to keep at Versailles really do? Social history gives us little bits from which we infer greater pictures, small stories that collectively create a whole, just as individuals make up communities, and communities make up a people and a culture. Humankind certainly does have its merits and its own appeal, as does social history more broadly. At the very least, you can see why bottom-up narratives of change and power are exciting for people who enjoy being part of broader collectives. The sense that we accomplish things is a powerful one. There is one very important element of social history that humankind kind of ignores, though. So, okay. Humankind passes the hurdle of de-emphasizing great people, and it speaks to the collective changes a society faces on a cultural level, which is indeed an example of gradual structural change. But does it pass the second test? Does it speak of any other structures? What does it say about class? What about social castes, gender disparity, conflicts within cultures? One of the best functional uses of social history for just one example among many, is exploring the lives of women. Great man history would be a very lacking lens for such a study. For one, quite literal to its name, its narratives surround men. Women sometimes make the books. I mean, there's a Catherine the Great, and Civ has many female leaders available. But that just shows women existed as individuals. Just as it would be foolish to look at Versailles and say, ah, the way the French lived in 1750, it would be equally dubious to try and study the role and limitations of women in society based on a literal monarch. Within the limits of great man history, there is no way to explore the roles of women as a class. Humankind falls into the general pit of the genre, of lacking much internal narrative for a country. Civ and EU4 are an imperfect representation of history precisely because they are focused very much on the clash between nations, between empires. Humankind is much the same, but it tiptoes into the water of escaping more traditional forms of history and, to that end, I think, deserves both more attention and more scrutiny. It may not be perfect, but these games kind of can't be when it comes to modeling social history. That said, humankind does, I think, exemplify the biggest shift one needs to take to get to a more social, material, historical lens. It escapes the gravity of great men, accomplishing something few games in the genre manage to. We, as players, are driven away from speaking in terms of the accomplishments of individuals and towards thinking of collectives that aren't defined as unchanging nation-states. In that way, it becomes an exploration of people, of peoples through an alternative historical lens to its contemporaries as a game. And finally, it should be noted that much of the game's limitations in doing social history are shared across the entire genre, either as gaming conventions or as limitations to the medium as a whole. That humankind is able to limit its leaders in-game to semi-mythological figures who don't hold monumental sway over the game is nothing short of a triumph given the broader genre. Hey, speaking of triumph and semi-mythical leaders, next time, officially, we'll be talking about King Arthur and Rome using Crusader Kings 3. Next time, unofficially, is a bonus episode exploring the bigger issues with games and social history. We'll see how it goes. And if you're catching this video from outside the channel, now's a good time for me to say that it's part of a broader series of which there's already been a few episodes. Maybe go check it out and maybe subscribe so you don't miss the next one. Uh, yeah. Bye.